So I'm going to show you two examples uh, of carbon projects. One is from Uganda. So Kibale is a national park um, that um, they did the reforestation project. So they had this kind of savanna looking land and they planted trees. They helped restore the forest and they say, oh, and it will be good for, for the chimpanzees that live there and for other wildlife, it will be very good. In a way, it's pretty easy. Eh? You have a grassland with little carbon, you plant trees, and if you wait a long time, long, long time, they will grow and you'll have more carbon. But of course, you need to, how much carbon can you get from these trees growing? Eh? Not too much, trees grow slowly. So it's easier to make the calculations and the project, but of course, it's less money. Then the second example is going to be about Gola. This uh, is a rainforest in Sierra Leone, and it's the biggest carbon project avoiding deforestation in Africa at the moment. I used to work for them. That's why I want to show you about it. So let's start with Kibale. So Kibale, we have the yellow patches, that's where the tourists go. They mostly go to see the chimpanzees, but they also have some nice wildlife. And uh, the green areas, the colors are a bit funny, eh? but anyway. So yellow is a lot of animals, green is few animals, and this dark green, which is the project area, is degraded land. So they thought, okay, if we can restore this land, the animals will move from one to another. And you know, by planting trees, we give jobs to people to plant the trees, it'll be good for our endangered mo chimpanzees. So we actually try to get certified BCS, the normal one to calculations, and the CCB, the one that is a little bit extra money for helping the local community and for helping biodiversity. So first you need to sell your story. Eh? What was going to happen to your land if you don't do a carbon project? So what was the baseline? What would happen without the project? And what did you do additional to make it different? So they claim that these 15,000 hectares of land, so this area here, if nothing was gone, there would still be encroachment. People would still farm there, there would still be fire, so there would not be a lot of carbon. There's not many opportunities for employment, and then also there would not be a lot of tourists coming because the area will be not appealing for the wildlife and therefore for the tourists as well. So that's what they claim. So very important when you think about a carbon project, eh, is what are you going to tell the consultant when he arrives? No, no, sir, eh, if we don't do the carbon project, this place would be, would be like this. So you need to come up with a story. What would be like? So they come up with a story that they would be encroached and the land would be degraded. So what did they do? It's actually one of the oldest uh, projects in Africa. They started in 94 to plant trees. And they already planned to live for 70 years, imagine. Eh? The person that started it would not see the end. But he's thinking about their children, so it's not bad. So they start to plant trees in the middle. This is the year, so this is where they start the dark red and then a lot with the time they've been planting trees in all these other places. Eh? So in 2009 they, they were certified by another company, they changed to BCS because it's the most recognized at the moment. So they planted so far of the 15, sorry, thousand hectares that they planned to, is their carbon uh, project area, they already planted 4,000 and 2,600 have naturally regenerated. And I think it was very smart from them that in the beginning they planted in the middle, like creating a corridor between the two areas, but then they decided they should start planting at the edge, because you see the birds and the monkeys move from here to here. So actually this land in the middle, without a lot of investment by themselves, the monkeys already and the birds, you know, they disperse the seed there, and now it's protecting from fire because fire is only in this side. So slowly this area regenerates as well into forest with less investment. So it's very important how you plan your project, okay? So just as a question, you can check on Google Kivale uh, National Park Carbon Project and maybe you can tell me in the afternoon if they're still selling their carbon credits or not. We can talk about this in the afternoon. So the other one I'm going to talk about is the one I used to work for. So this is Gola Rainforest in Sierra Leone. This is very different, eh? 70,000 hectares. So the other one, 15? The other one? This is a big, big project. Eh? Just in 10 years, they try to conserve 4 million tons of CO2. This is huge numbers eh? compared with the other one. This one has 60 threatened species. It also has chimpanzees, forest elephants, and quite a few endemic uh, monkeys and dikers, cephalophs, that are endangered in the area. They try to 
help support the livelihood of 114 communities. So just imagine, eh? getting the paperwork of all these guys to sign that they agree with the project was a nightmare. And then they also tried to get certified BCS and CCB. So the project uh, idea was that to do all the calculations and start the project in 2012 and it would last for 30 years. And the project area is this used to be a forest reserve, this green area, and then this is the leakage belt. And I like this figure because you see, if people were meant to clear the forest for farming, and now we protect the forest, we save the carbon, we save the forest from deforestation, these people still need to eat. So they would go in what they established the leakage belt and they estimated that this is the areas where there would be forest clearing anyway for farming. So this part of CO2 emissions of degrading this forest in the leakage belt, you cannot sell the credits for that because that would happen anyway. And just a, a little bit on the and this one, you can also check if it's still ca selling carbon credits. Eh? I hope they do because I spent so much time on this before. <laughs> but you can tell me in the afternoon. And I just as a hint, does anybody know what was the major threat to this forest? This is Sierra Leone. Eh? Has anybody seen the film Blood Diamond? Mm. So what is the threat to this forest? Mining. Mining. Mining for diamonds, actually. This is the border with Liberia. This is actually where the film it was filmed somewhere else, but it was meant to be happening here. So that is the problem. The real threat to this forest is not small-scale agriculture, I can tell you. It's illegal mining. Both large-scale by big companies and small-scale by people. So this is a map that we managed to get, which I should not share. There are the mining licenses within the forest. You can see they overlap. But of course, when you design your project, how and you have to justify what is going to happen to your forest, how can you justify that the forest reserve is going to be cleared by the same government? So this is something you need to think of when you think about designing your carbon project, that sometimes the biggest threat is something else, but maybe you cannot document it. So you will never be able to justify it in this way and turn it in a carbon project. So actually these guys, they had the support of a big NGO in UK and they were very smart. They said, yeah, we know mining is the problem, but we still want to save this forest. We'll find another way to justify it. So they actually started, it was a long process thinking, okay, the real problem is industrial mining, the concessions and operations and all the bribing related to it, but we cannot justify. Okay, we'll do the paperwork for small-scale mining, again, how do you justify? This is not even planned. Eh? This is even worse, the other one. How can you plan where the mining goes? And in small-scale mining, it's hard to see from the sky using remote sensing. Eh? So it would still look like forest. It would just be degraded, not deforested. Then they start thinking, okay, this was actually in the old days, in the colonial times, this was a forest reserve for logging, not for protection. Maybe we can claim it was a forest reserve. It was going to be cut down. But you know what? The good timber is already gone, eh? so it's hard to justify it's going to happen. Then we can always go to the small scale mining. You know, people go with a power saw and cut a few trees. It also affects carbon, eh? also hard to justify. So at the end, they had two left in the list. They said, okay, they can clear land for agriculture. Big patches of land will be cleared to turn it into a palm oil plantation. It actually happened somewhere else in Sierra Leone. But you know, here is really far, eh? there's no roads. So even if you make a lot of palm oil, it's hard to sell it, so it's unlikely. So at the end, they went back to what may be the case for many parts of Africa, is a small scale agriculture. Maybe we don't clear a lot of land, but you know what? We are a lot of people. So at the end of the day, numbers may be easier to compensate. So just think about that when you design your project. What is the baseline? What would happen? and make sure you can justify it. So as I said, I spent two years there measuring a lot of trees to make the calculations. So I'm going to show you a couple of numbers. So we measured the trees in the forest and this is what it's called above ground biomass. We'll talk a little bit more after the coffee break. So we had about 600, which is pretty high for a rainforest below ground biomass. This is in the roots. That's what Ben wife does, measure roots also quite a lot of carbon. And we took samples of the soil and we added up. So we estimated 1,000 
a ton of carbon per hectare in the central part of the forest that has never been locked and 900 in the southern part. So this looks like quite a lot. I can tell you it's quite a lot for a rainforest. Then the question is, okay, but you know these people will not clear the land and become zero. They'll do slash and burn agriculture. So some trees will remain, they'll let it follow and they come back later. So it's not that it becomes zero. So we had to estimate how much carbon was in these fallows, in these jachers, you know, to compare. And we estimated about 300. So okay, so if we say we have 900, and after, if we don't do anything, there'll be 300, there's still 600 we can sell, isn't it? Still quite a lot, eh? The point is that, remember, it's not just about how much we have, we have 900, how much would be without the forest, the 300, it's also about the leakage. So we need to remove how much these other guys are going to farm and deforest elsewhere, and also how much the project costs. And I think this is something, things that we forget. You know, running a project also creates CO2. The cars that are moving around, the consultants that fly in from other countries. So this is something that also needs to be computed. And when we make this, this is the real amount of credits that we can sell. So then the question came when I was working there, it's like, oh, but you know, if this southern part of the forest was locked before and now it's recovering because it, it, logging stopped in the early 70s, so now the forest is recovering. So we did a small survey to see how much carbon was there in 2006 and how much in 2012. And just in six years, we increased 40 tons of CO2 per hectare, which is a, quite a bit. So people were very excited. Oh, wow, what does it mean? You know, is it worth investing in monitoring how the forest is recovering here? And actually, because this is a big forest, it was worth it. It made one to three million difference in dollars on how much money the project would sell in the 30 years time. So in this case, definitely worth it to consider carbon recovery. But in smaller projects, maybe it's not worth it. Another question that came up, it's about CCB certified. Do we invest in monitoring the special biodiversity that we have to get this extra certification so we can sell our carbon instead of $10 for 15? And in this case, I mean, it looked like it had a huge potential. This is a pygmy hippo. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's a very cute animal, only found in Sierra Leone and Liberia. It's like this tiny little hippo. And it's highly endangered. They have a lot of endangered species. But for example, they have two that they haven't been seen for more than 10 years. So it gets back to the same thing. If we want to get certified that we're helping biodiversity, we need to know what we have. So we need to invest in a survey and then in the monitoring. Again, in this case, they had a lot, so it was worth the investment. Where are the Oh. Oh. Yes. There are some also. I didn't put them up. I didn't know there would be botanists in the room. Sorry. <laughs> I can tell you some of them if you want. <laughs> so, just about the carbon project. So, if you start too small, it might not be worth the investment. If you get too large or too complex, also difficult. It might get very expensive to make all these calculations and these surveys. And be careful with timing. You need to consider that the carbon price change and also maybe the condition in your country might change. So where are the best places to do carbon projects in Africa? And I really like this map. So let me see if somebody can spot something strange about it. So in general, the map says that red is not the best place. Blue and yellow is much better. And if we have a quick look, we can see there's most of the forest zone. Though it's either avoiding deforestation or because there's nice rainfall trees grow fast so we can reforest. And my question is here, why Gabon is no priority if it has big forests? Yeah? Maybe. Yeah, you can say, Franka, yeah. In that you come to say, if there is no threat there for deforestation and so, mm -hmm. and so on, there is no population mm -hmm. which can destroy forests. It's not priority. Very good point. So Gabon is highly forested, population density is very low, and they mostly live in urban centers. Mm. So trying to justify that your forest is a threat will be harder. 
good observation, frankly. And then I really like this paper, I think it's in the literature that I sent you, because then it said that another important thing to consider is not just where you have a lot of carbon, but there are other factors like where you have biodiversity and endemism, maybe you can get this extra certified so you get a little bit extra money, where is the land tenure clear, and also maybe what is the governance, eh? so in some countries getting things running is a little bit harder, so it might also discourage people. So I talk a lot about forests because that's what I work on, but I'm going to give you two examples that are not tropical forests. So it's because as you know, some ecosystems not only may have fewer trees, but also the trees are shorter. But in these cases, maybe it's important to consider the extension of this, how big are these ecosystems of our project. Maybe we have fewer trees, but we have a million hectares. Maybe it's still worth a carbon project. And I think it's very important to think also about the soil. So let's start about the surface. So this is Fazao Malfacasa National Park in Togo. Our Benin colleague may know about it. It looks very similar to the parks they have in, in Benin as well. So Benin is here and this is Togo. Central Togo is this savanna forest ecosystem. And this is a map of the national park. And as you may see, it looks pretty interesting because there's a lot of villages inside the national park. Well, historically, you know, protected areas in Africa are not like in the US. Eh? We have a lot of places where people live inside and it's hard to kick them out. So this area, so although it's a park, it's agroforestry, they have farms and trees, and then they have, as we move along this way, there's some hills here, so we have different types of savanna more shrub savanna, more open savanna, more savanna woodland, we look more like the Miombo for those people of Southern Africa, and we get to closed canopy forest. So we, is a colleague of mine that actually made the calculation, okay, how much carbon do we have in every ecosystem? And the question was like, would be a carbon project worth it? So we made the calculations and the closed canopy forest had about 200 megagrams of biomass per hectare. And the open forest, it looks more like a kind of miombo kind of thing you want to call it, only 79. But the point is the surface. So because the surface of the open forest is a lot more than the closed canopy forest, actually in total amount of carbon for the park it was nearly the same. So if we want to invest in a carbon project, it's probably worth it doing both of them if we focus on the can closed canopy forests, they're very small, although they have a lot of carbon in our study area, they're so small, that if we don't get into the others, it might not be worth calling the consultant and so on. So it's important to think about the extent of your habitat. And the next example comes from Congo, and that's a little bit going back to the question that Town had, so how does it DRC compare to Brazil? And I think this is the, the answer. So, so the interesting part is not just what, the, what we see in terms of carbon, so what we see outside, the trees or the bushes or the mangroves, whatever you have, is also what is underneath. And when we think about what is underneath, peat becomes as a crucial factor. So what is peat? Peat is organic matter that was not decomposed and it, because of anoxic conditions in like these kind of swampy areas and it stayed there for very, very, very long time. So we have a lot of carbon staying there. It's like a storehouse of carbon, which doesn't seem to be a problem, of course, if you don't release it, is it? So it looks a bit like this. So you have these kind of swampy areas. I think you don't see very well here, but most of these swamp forests initially didn't attract a lot of attention when we made carbon calculations because they have few trees. They mostly have palms, which palms have low carbon density, so people were not caring much about them, until the situation started to change in Southeast Asia, where companies start to dry these swamps and burn them to turn it into plantations, mostly of palm oil. And as we burn these dried soils that have meters of carbon, we are releasing tons and tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's how the interest in peatland in the tropics started. And I want to talk about DR Congo because recently it was discovered the largest P 
peatland in the tropics, larger than the ones in Southeast Asia that they wet all the concern. And that's why it's so important for DRC. It's not just about the trees that they have, obviously they have a big rainforest, it's about what they have underneath. And the numbers are shocking. So there are 50, 145,000 hectares of this peatland. We don't even know for sure because this is very recent. Eh? You see, of all this area, research was only done in this part. It might even be more. We still don't know. The area, they estimated that the depth of this pit is between 0.3 to 6 meters. And in this peatland complex, eh, the Cuvette Central, there's as much carbon stored as the whole of the Congo Basin together. So all the trees in the whole of the Congo Basin is the same as this peatland. Which is crazy, isn't it? Now the question comes, do you think it's worth to turn this into a carbon project? Any comments? Yeah? Uh, the problem is that not the country that use that pit for power generation. Do they have alternative? No, no I think the, it's a good point. So to have a carbon project, as I said, the first thing you need to show is that the, the land is threatened. So if they didn't even have, no, they had this, and they were not planning to use it for anything, either to extract it, to burn it, to make electricity, or either to convert it to a palm oil plantation. So if this is a huge pitland, but it was not going to be converted to anything, it's actually hard to justify. You can turn it into a carbon project, although it's, the numbers are huge. So just remember that one. It's not just how much you have, but also that you can justify it was going to change without your project. So I put this website and um, there's some other carbon projects uh, happening in Africa. So to have an idea of which kind of projects people are doing. And this website has other types of projects about wetlands and payments for species like pollinators. So it's a good website to have a look at. I think I checked and there are 71 examples in Africa only. And in the BCS website, the ones that uh, check that you did your right calculations for your carbon, they have other types of projects, not just on forestry and land use, so avoiding deforestation or planting trees, restoring land. They have also some on like uh, renewable energy and changes in transport, so it's a good place also to look for ideas on projects or just to see what's going on. And what time is the coffee break? Sorry, I forgot. It's okay, cool. No, I was just thinking I was running. Okay, cool. No, we still have time then. So now I'm going to talk briefly about the regulatory market. What about if carbon becomes compulsory? So are we ready for red? So if you remember, red was reducing, em uh, sorry, reducing emissions from deforestation, forest degradation, uh, natural forests, and changing land use. Actually, I forgot the plus here. So, of course, to make this happen in a compulsory way that all the countries in the world are involved in this, eh? the ones in the south, in the tropics that have all these forests and stuff, they need to be prepared, is it? So there's been quite a lot of money thrown in, especially by Norway, you know, rich country with a lot of oil. So mixed interest for the carbon compulsory thing to be in place. So that's why they invested a lot in helping the poorer countries prepare. So the, they started, the initial pilot projects for RED were Brazil and Peru, in South America, Cameroon and Tanzania in Africa, and Indonesia and Southeast Asia. But you can see that over the time, other countries have started to get prepared, to make calculations, to see how is this going to happen, to maybe start a pilot project in the voluntary market, to see how it works, how we're developing. And, um, I think it's interesting because for me it's quite shocking that in Africa we have this gap. How come Gabon and Congo Brazzaville are not getting prepared? You know, they have a lot of rainforest as well. And what about uh, West Africa, you know? I show you for Sierra Leone and what about Liberia? What about Ghana? Why are they, why are they not getting prepared? And uh, well, there's other issues, but let me just go to a few examples about this. So there was a study done um, a little while ago now actually that said actually even if we implement RED, you know, if, if, if we make it happen, can it happen? I mean, would it ever work? 
and even if it works, would it really achieve the goals? And I think it's very important to understand that, that red is not just, the idea of red is not just about saving the tropical forest and restoring the tropical forest. The idea, when it was designed, it was that it would have these co-benefits. So the communities would get paid to save their forest and they would be better off. And this obviously can be a big challenge. Yeah? And the pilot projects that they started in red is a mixed. Some work, some didn't work. And they reviewed in this paper and the main four things that came out is that one of the biggest issues to determine if your carbon project will be successful is which is the deforestation? What was planned to happen and how would you address it? So like the one I show you for Sierra Leone, they planned small scale uh, agriculture and they accounted for leakage. So maybe as they already accounted, that, okay, no, we cannot do anything about it. We're just shifting it outside, but maybe helping it reduce by providing training in cocoa agroforestry. So this was key on when you design your project. The second part is how do you share your benefits? Obviously, if your local communities or your neighbors don't get anything, it's very unlikely your project will be successful. The third one was about property rights. And then the, the fourth was about stakeholders. <laughs> and I think this is pretty sad, but it's a reality. Of 23 red pilot projects run by C4, this is an international organization that focuses on forestry, only four are still selling credits. So you can see it's not easy, eh? because if these guys, there is a big international NGO, cannot manage to set these 23 pilot projects to go, it means it's hard. And then these are some of the challenges that they come up in this. It's also a very nice paper. So getting the funds to start, to make all the calculations, to make sure you know what you're doing, getting the local stakeholders, the local committees still have access to what they think is important for them, not becoming political, you know, in some countries it's very easy to get into politics, either for good or for bad. Building the capacity of the people in place to monitor, if every time we need to fly consultants, it becomes very expensive to run our project. And also to make sure that the people feel um, okay with what you plan for them. And I just want to show you three examples from Africa about some of the issues of red. The first one is from Tanzania. So it's about the watershed of the Eastern Arc Mountains. So the Eastern Arc Mountains are, have some forests. I know the figure is not the greatest, sorry. It's like the purple patches. Eh? So they're these mountains with a little forest. And actually these guys, Wilcock et al, 2012, estimated the carbon of the whole watershed. So how did they do it? First, they got a land cover map, like the one you were playing with the other day uh, with uh, QGIS. And then they put some plots to measure the carbon in every land cover, some in the forest, some in the savanna woodland, some in the open savanna, some in the croplands. And then they make their calculations and they came up with this map, how much carbon they have. Of course this was an investment eh, to make all these calculations and to get all these plots, but actually it seems it was definitely worth it, because by doing these calculations they had 50% more carbon that what would have had if they had used the general IPCC estimates. So as you can see, to get prepared for red on a way, you also need to invest to make sure that what you get, I mean, these guys were going to miss 50% of the money. Eh? I mean, we're talking about a lot of, a lot of dollars. So there's some issues that the default is that you can just use whatever IPCC, what these guys generate, if you don't have money to invest and do better calculations for your country. But maybe we should do the better calculations for our country because it's, it's quite different what we get. So this is another uh, example from Kenya this time. So this is a, quite a famous project in Kenya. I think it's the oldest carbon project in Kenya, the Kasigao Corridor. So there's two national parks, Sabo East and Sabo West. This is in kind of central South Kenya. They have a lot of wildlife, these two national parks, lots of tourists going there. So what they decided to do, they decided to engage with the local communities living in this area to create a corridor, the Kasigao Corridor. So they planted trees and they helped restore the degraded land. So this was not a deforestation project. Eh? They just helped restore the degraded savanna, we can call it. They get certified BCS and CCB because they help the communities 
and also they had the biodiversity, yeah? you know, elephants, giraffes, I don't know, zebra, everything is there. What was the problem in this pilot project? The problem was that the elite captured all the money. So the, we are not talking about the government, eh? we are talking about the local chief, the local ranger, the local whatever. So actually people that were the ones cutting the firewood and making a living from the environment, they didn't, get, they didn't see a lot. So they were very angry. So that's one of the challenges that we see in red, is that it's hard to make sure that the benefits get distributed fairly. And the third example, it's from Congo, where they haven't even started. Sorry, Frank. <laughs> and the problem in Congo, the biggest problem, is land tenure. It's also in some other countries in Africa, but I just wanted to bring up this one. So there's the state law that says this land is owned by the state. And then the traditional law that says this land is owned by a certain ethnic group, a certain tribe that was living there before. And they all accept it and it doesn't matter as long as nobody comes with a carbon project. But somebody comes with a carbon project, oh yeah, you know, we have a logging concession here. You know, actually, our logging concession eh, is very far from roads. Eh? It costs us a lot of money to exploit this timber. It might be better if we turn our logging concession, we haven't even started logging yet, into a carbon project. Eh? And they come to the local communities, hey, what do you think? Are you okay? Yeah, because we need to sign the papers. And the local communities say, do you have a logging concession in our land? Are you kidding? This is our land. So it turns into a very big project because, I mean, sorry, a very big problem because people don't even know which land they own. They don't have papers. You know, historically, people didn't record things. Eh? It was all like friends like this. So it's becoming a very big issue, in, especially in the eastern part, equatorial part of <coughs> DR Congo. It's not just about knowing who owns the land and who would benefit from the carbon payments. Another big problem here is that local communities are very dependent on the forest for their livelihoods. So they go fishing, they go hunting, they actually without the forest. Are, the, some don't even do farming. They have no other way of making an income or a living. So it's also addressing how are we going to deal with them if we turn this into a carbon project. Maybe we can continue the fishing but not cutting the trees, because obviously the carbon project is about cutting the trees. So it's a big challenge. <coughs>